And our second scripture reading for this morning will come from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Very easy for me to remember this week. 3, 4, 5, 6. <laughs> and actually, it's, what's also nice is I have it in large print even, so that's even better. So um, that's uh, page 828 if you want to follow along in your pew Bible. So 828 in the pew Bibles. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. <laughs> And that reads, In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of in Christ Jesus. Give me one second here. So we've made it to this point. This is the um, the last message in this series of pursuing our purpose. And I've started off each one with kind of a recap, so I'm going to do that again today just to remind us of where we are. So the first message within this series was about Hannah. And Hannah, she had to give up in order to gain. And so what she did, she actually gave up her dream to raise a child by dedicating any child she would bear to God's service. And in return, God blessed her not just with this child, but with an entire family's worth of children. The second message was about Samuel and Samuel's journey of growth from a lowly apprentice to anointing kings and the difficult decisions he had to make in order to get there. Last week's message was about Eli, the priest, and the danger of standing still, how his failure to make those tough, de- uh, tough decisions ended up costing him everything. Today's message is about a woman named Ruth. This is going to be, hopefully for you today, a very encouraging message. That It's about how Ruth left an incredible legacy to her family, but also to the entire world. So I just read from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. <laughs> and uh, this happens to be one of my very favorite passages of scripture that whenever I get an opportunity to either preach on this passage or to write on this passage I take it because it's a very very fascinating uh, passage inside of the Bible it is about the mystery of Christ that existed all throughout the Old Testament but was kind of veiled to the people who adhered to the Word of God back then and that mystery was this that the riches of God's kingdom are inclusively exclusive. They're inclusively exclusive. So what does that mean exactly? Well, to kind of give you the context, the Israelites for the longest time thought that these promises that were made to them were only for their nation. But what God revealed in the Old Testament very explicitly is that God has made peace with the whole world through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. So not only were the sins of the nation of Israel taken care of, but those of all the people outside of the nation of Israel as well. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, The exclusive part of this is that the promise of eternal life is only granted to those who would repent and believe Jesus. Okay, So those who would repent and believe Jesus would be the only beneficiaries of this inclusive promise. <clears throat> this, I don't want there to be any confusion. This was not a brand new promise that was made to the world, but it was something that was foreshadowed all throughout the Old Testament. It was something that you see playing out in the different stories as these foreigners came into the camp of Israel and God blessed them as people just like the people of Israel. 
because of this mystery, it appeared that Ruth, and this is an Old Testament book, by the way, was not part of the Old Testament. She was a Moabite, not an Israelite, a descendant of Lot, not a descendant of Abraham. And it reminded me about this movie that I saw about a year ago now, uh, where the main character doesn't know who her parents are. And it's kind of a mystery as to who they are. Everybody thinks there's somebody significant. And then the villain, though, confronts her and to discourage her, tells her, your parents abandoned you. You don't know who your parents are because they aren't even a part of this story. Well, that's kind of where Ruth is right here. She wasn't even a part of this story that was unfolding inside of the nation of Israel, at least not to the eyes of those who were around her. But that was what made her romance with Boaz so interesting. Speaking about romance, by the way, I heard the story of a man who was sitting on an airplane next to an attractive single woman. He struck up a conversation with her and asked her what types of men she's interested in. So she responded, there's three types of guys that I particularly like. I like Native Americans because of their high cheekbones and their golden tans. I like Jewish men because they are brilliant and successful. And I like Southerners for their Southern southern draw. And she was curious, she said, What's your name? He responded, My name is Geronimo Bernstein. (laughs) But my friends call me Bubba. (laughs) So, Ruth, apparently, likes successful Jewish men as well. (laughs) Ruth, before having met Boaz, she was married to a Jewish man who actually had passed away not long into their marriage. So she never bore children. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, however, ended up becoming depressed because her only other son had passed away, but also her husband had passed away too. So this left her as a childless widow. So life wasn't looking too good for her, and she told her two daughter-in-laws, go back to your home, your home countries, go back with your parents. I don't have any other children for you to marry, as it was a custom for them to marry the brother if they had not born any children. And she said, I, didn't, I don't have any more children for you to marry, so go back to your home countries. Find somebody there that you can marry that will take care of you. But Ruth had developed a real heart for her mother-in-law. And she said, I will not leave you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Naomi just couldn't get rid of this girl. And so instead, what she decided to do is she knew of a relative of hers that owned some fields And so Ruth decided not only to stay with Naomi, but to work in the fields of Boaz, gathering up loose grain that had maybe fallen on the ground and and bring it back so her and uh, Naomi had something to eat. Ruth, uh, it looked like Ruth and Naomi's lives in this regard were, were pretty hopeless. They're basically eating the leftovers of somebody else's garden, if you think about it. And so it it looked like this was going to be their lot in life. In fact, Naomi had even changed her name to a Hebrew name that means bitter, that God had made her bitter. But Boaz, he had heard about how Ruth was taking care of Naomi. He knew of Naomi's situation because he was related to her. And because Ruth was being so generous and kind by staying with her mother-in-law and taking care of her and bringing food home for her, putting in this hard labor for her, that he said, you know what? I'm going to make life a little bit easier for her. I'm going to reward her by 
placing her among the other women. You know, when you get depressed, when you get upset about something, what is our tendency? Get away from me. Everybody stay away. I'm going to be working by myself, not saying a word, and just kind of thinking things over in my head. So just stay away. Boaz took the initiative and put her among other women. And on top of that, he saw that she was a pretty gal. And so what he told the men working in the field, said, stay away from her. Don't touch her. Leave her alone. Let her do her work. And so Boaz was very sympathetic to the situation. She was him very grateful for what she was doing. On top of that, he even started to tell the men when he saw her work, said, pluck stalks out, out, out of the ground for her and leave them on the ground for her. Make her job easy. Ruth got really excited because this man Boaz was doing all these things for her. So he told Naomi all about her, uh, all about him. And then Naomi told her, said, well, you know, this man Boaz, I'm related to him. You know what that means? He's the most eligible bachelor around for you. Well, Ruth was excited about this. So they started planning how it is they could make this move to express her love for, for Boaz. And when that day came, Boaz was just blown away that this young lady would take interest in him. And because he was an older man, and there's all these young men, fit young men, working in the fields, which she could have chosen to marry if she wanted to, but instead she took interest in him because of his generosity and kindness. When you think about this, it's a really ordinary story, actually. I know there are some interesting elements to it, but to tell you the truth, I've heard love stories among my friends that are more interesting than this story right here. But I think that's one of the things that's very appealing about it. It's just a nice, ordinary story. But it becomes extraordinary when we discover that Ruth was King David's great-grandmother. So there's a twist there. It's not till the very end you find out that her grandson is Jesse, the father of David. Ruth left a legacy for her children, grandchildren, and onward. It's fascinating to me that Boaz and Ruth, their initials together, if you saw it written on a tree, B and R, is actually like another B and R couple. If you saw B and R written on a tree in North Carolina, for instance, you might be asking yourself, is this Ruth and Boaz or is this Billy Graham and Ruth Ann Graham? Could be either one. I don't know. <laughs> you could probably guess, I suppose. Um, but uh, Billy and Ruth Ann Graham, in talking about legacy and how to create a legacy, for yourself, for your own family, and not even necessarily for your own family. If you don't have kids, that's all right. You can still leave a legacy. And they gave four pointers to do this. They said, one, live lives of humility and quiet peace. We see this played out in the life of Ruth. She wasn't looking at getting noticed. Same thing with Naomi. They live lives of quiet peace, and you most certainly see this played out in the life of David as he ministers and rules the nation of Israel. They said, two, honor your marriage vows. Very central part of the theme of our story today is these marriage vows. Number three, protect your ministry. We all have ministries here. In fact, I like how my Baptist friends put it. They say, do not lose your testimony. And what does that mean exactly? When you're a believer in Jesus, you have a testimony to share with people. And so we need, not, we need to protect that testimony. Don't lose that testimony by do things that diminish your faith in the eyes of others. And number four, keep the gospel at the forefront of your lives. Make sure that that's what you lead your life with so that your coworkers aren't wondering about who you are, what your core values are, but instead make that known to them that I believe in Jesus. Ask to pray for them. Ask to do things for them. Share the love that you have, not only for them, but the love that you have for Jesus with them as well. You see, unbeknownst to Ruth, 
Her legacy was the fertile ground from which the gospel would bloom. And what I found very fascinating is when I open up my Bible to do more research on Ruth in Matthew chapter 1. When you're going through the boring genealogy at the beginning of that, where it says this person begat this person, who begat this person, and begat this person, there are just a few women mentioned inside that genealogy. And the first one, which I found very fascinating, was actually Boaz's mother, which happened to be who? Rahab. I'm not going to go into that right now, but if you're familiar with the story of Rahab, that's very fascinating. The other one within verse 5 happens to be Ruth. What is this genealogy all about? It's about the bloodline of Jesus. And so her legacy extended far beyond King David, Israel's greatest king, as acknowledged by the Jews today, but goes on to the world's greatest king and true king, that of Jesus Christ. And the Lord found it fit to include her in this genealogy of his son, Jesus Christ. The story of Ruth gives us a glimpse at God's love for the world, of those outside of the nation of Israel, as this Jewish man generously took in this foreign woman who had lost her previous husband and cared for her, provided for her, and loved for her, and in this essence, gave her and Naomi salvation. What legacy will you leave? Like I said, you might not have children to pass it on to, but there's somebody in your life, somebody you can show love to, somebody that you can care about, somebody you can share the Bible with, could be a coworker. Could be a kid at the YMCA. Could be somebody maybe you teach at school. Could just be a friend or family member. D.L. Moody is a man who led thousands of people to Jesus. But he came to know Jesus not through a family member. He actually came to know Jesus through a Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball. I bet you, Edward Kimball, he may not have thought twice about what his life would amount to. And yet, he happened to be the person to bring one of the greatest evangelists of our era to Jesus Christ. You can leave a legacy too. You can leave a legacy of peace, faithfulness, good character, or maybe even just a good sense of humor. That's pretty nice, isn't it? No matter what sort of legacy you want to leave, not just for your family, but for this world, it all begins with prayer. At this time, I'd like to ask you to join me in a word of prayer as we wrap up this message. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Ruth, for this ordinary story. As Lord ultimately at the end of our lives, we all live ordinary lives. We don't always understand how we fit into the story. We might feel like we're not part of the story. <clears throat> but we see that through your grace, by your mighty hand, each one of us plays a role and each one of us leaves a legacy. Let our legacies be great. Be ones that bless our friends, our families, and everyone we know, where they may just hear of us for many generations to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.